Well, hello everyone, wherever you may be. Thanks for tuning into our event today, which focuses on US policy priorities in Afghanistan. This event marks the latest event of the Wilson Center's Hindsight Upfront Initiative, which keeps you informed about the future of Afghanistan, its people, the region, and why it matters. You can get more information from the initiative website, which is afghanistan.wilsoncenter.org. It's been nearly two months since the US completed its withdrawal from Afghanistan, but the US still has many policy concerns in Afghanistan. This includes the evacuations of any remaining US citizens that wish to leave, the delivery of humanitarian support to the Afghan people, and the development of a capacity to degrade terrorist threats, among other things. All of this comes against the backdrop of a policy conundrum. Addressing these issues will likely entail some degree of engagement and negotiations with the Taliban government that Washington has not recognized. But the stakes are quite high, given, for example, the scale of the humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan, which is hard to overstate. We have a great group of panelists to discuss these issues today. All of them are experienced Afghan hands, former senior US officials, and most of them are former ambassadors focused on Afghanistan and the region. And we also have a very distinguished moderator today. That is Ambassador Tony Wayne. He is a colleague of mine. He's a Wilson Center Public Policy Fellow and he's also a former deputy ambassador in Afghanistan. He's also a former ambassador to Mexico and Argentina. And he has numerous uh, current affiliations. One of them is distinguished diplomat in residence at American University's School of International Service, which happens to be my alma mater, hence why I choose to mention that particular current affiliation among others. But um, I will turn things over to Ambassador Wayne in just a moment. But first, just a note, um, if you have a question for the panelists during the event, please email it to asia at wilsoncenter.org or tweet it to at Asia Program. Uh, with that, I turn things over to you, Ambassador Wayne. Well, th thank you very much, Michael. It's a great pleasure to be here with you and with my colleagues uh, who have each spent uh, years working on parts of our relationship with Afghanistan and the region. We have Ambassador Ron Newman, who was ambassador in, in Afghanistan, uh, Ambassador James Cunningham, who also was ambassador in Afghanistan, uh, Ambassador and former Assistant Secretary Robin Rafel, who was Assistant Secretary for uh, South Central Asia, the bureau that includes Afghanistan and spent a good deal of time working in Pakistan, and Annie Forsheimer, who was the number two in Kabul uh, fairly recently, and then was the acting deputy assistant secretary of state for Afghanistan. So, and 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 she worked there a number of years before. Well, well, I served there also. So we have a lot of experience um, in trying to figure out what the best U.S. policy should be, and to understand that situation in Afghanistan. But we're not going to look backward today. We're going to look forward. We're going to look at the current situation and what we as the United States should be doing about that um, with others and, and on our own. And of course, there are a number of, of big issues to be dealt with it. Let me just quickly mention some of them, uh, getting American citizens and those with close ties to the United States out of Afghanistan, those who are still there, dealing with the, the terrible humanitarian situation that now uh, endangers millions with uh, death over the months ahead over this uh, what's always a, a harsh winter in big parts of Afghanistan. Um, how the United States should deal with the Taliban regime and how it should work with its allies in dealing with them in, on a number of different uh, very difficult situations. The whole cluster of counterterrorism issues uh, and how we should look at the possibility of counterterrorism threats and the ongoing terrorism that's still taking place in Afghanistan. So uh, there's, there's a lot here and there's much more than that if we get into the challenges the Taliban is facing in trying to govern Afghanistan also. But what I'd like to ask everybody uh, to first give us some thoughts about is what should the, the top priority be at this moment for the United States looking at at this very complex situation that is touching the lives of millions of individuals. Now, let me start off asking Ambassador Ron Newman, 
to start and then I'll ask uh, Robin and then Jim and then Annie. So Ambassador Newman, please. Ambassador William, Tony, thank you very much. Uh, top priorities now, I think strategically our top priority is control of terrorism that could come out of Afghanistan, either directly against us, uh, but also I think the potential for terrorism and instability radiating in a variety of directions, which would in the end, I think also affect our interests. I would say that our moral high priority or second, pri second priority is getting out the people who have fought with us, the interpreters, the embassy employees, the ones eligible for the special immigrant visas. I put them second because I think national security always has to be first. Operationally, however, I think we will put much more work and need to put much more in getting people out because development of anything on the terrorist line will be quite slow. Behind that, I think I would say I personally believe we have a very large moral responsibility to a much larger class of Afghans who have accepted the values that we spent 20 years teaching and preaching and uh, who thought we had their back. Women, journalists, judges, it's the people who were honest policemen and so on. And I hope they won't be lost in the shuffle. I think there's a certain desire among some to just turn our back and walk away and say that's tough. But I think we have incurred a moral responsibility by the money we have poured in and the efforts and even sometimes the lives. One of our Foreign Service colleagues after all was killed carrying books to a girl's school. Um, and, you know, when people given their lives for these things it deserves to remain within our priorities, even if it cannot be our top one. So let me quit there. Thank you very much. Ambassador Rafel, Robin. Uh, thank you, Tony. And thank you for a panel that focuses on the future. I really appreciate that. Now I'm going to flip uh, Ron's priorities. And I'm going to say right now, the most pressing priority is the Afghan state and the Afghans who live there. Um, I think it's not in the U.S. interest to see people starving and selling their children on the street or institutions collapsing or another exodus of refugees and ISIS and other groups uh, taking advantage. I think after some initial bumps in the road, um, we really are fairly well organized now for evacuees and resettlement of Afghans that we've brought here. Um, you know, not perfectly, but um, you know, one of our colleagues, Ambassador Beth Jones, is now in charge of this at the State Department, and I think we're getting organized in that regard. And similarly, we've never stopped uh, looking at our main concern since 2001, which is counterterrorism. So I think while I agree it is a high priority, I think it's getting lots of attention. Um, I agree with Ron that we have a moral imperative um, and it is now with the Afghans who have stayed behind. Uh, we've promised all along that we wouldn't um, uh, desert Afghanistan, wash our hands of it as we did in the 90s. Um, and we shouldn't fool ourselves. If we do that, we will, we will take, a blame, take the blame and the Afghans will, will not soon forgive us. So you know, the, the punchline here is don't victimize the victims. We need to think more about the people and the institutions of the state. And I would say less about how much we disapprove rightly of the current occupants of the palace in Kabul. Um, humanitarian assistance, of course, is essential, but it's not enough. We need to support government ministries. We need to pay salaries of civil servants. We need to maintain infrastructure. Um, so let me stop there. Um, and um, you know, I'm happy to talk about how you do that and what the challenges are. Okay, thank you, Robin. Ambassador Cunningham, Jim, please. Thanks, Tony. Um, Picking up on what has already been said, I think, in my view, the, the main priority right now is not a strategic one, it's kind of an existential one. Um, 
for a whole variety of reasons, Afghanistan is on the verge of actually becoming a failed state, which it was not. And when I, when I spoke about Afghanistan over the years, I always emphasized that it wasn't a failed state, it was a struggling state. But now it is in danger of becoming a failed state across the board with all the humanitarian, political, and other implications for stability of the country and of the region. Addressing that issue is not just an American responsibility. Um, we, we owe a lot, unfortunately, to the way that the evacuation was conducted and in, in the rapid overturn uh, to Taliban authority, but there, it's an international obligation as well. So we, we and our partners really need to come together rather, rather urgently with a framework for how we are going to deal with the reality of the Taliban, which is a, a, a difficult prospect in many respects, but also how we can bring our resources and political influence to bear to force the Taliban to do things that we need and want them to do, including letting people out who want to leave and getting the assistance that's needed to people who, who need to be able to conduct the day-to-day -day business of the state, as Robin just said, but also basic things like getting some food for their families and other things when they can't have, they don't have money and they don't have jobs and they don't have any way of supporting themselves. If we don't do that, it will not just be a moral failing, but it will be a security failing as well because of the implications of what a destabilized Afghanistan will mean for the region. Uh, thank you, Jim, excellent points. Uh, Annie Forsheimer, please share some of your thoughts. Sure, I, I mean, of course I agree with all the points that have been raised. I would reframe it to say that the biggest policy priority I see right now is ensuring that this administration actually takes any of these topics as seriously as they need to be taken. And I put some emphasis in stating elsewhere that it's time for Congress to call the administration to account uh, in three key areas. The first one is the whole basket of issues relating to evacuations, resettlements. There are something between 14,000 and 17,000 humanitarian parole applications right now. And there is the verge of a lawsuit against uh, CIS, USCIS under Homeland Security because they actually haven't any of them apparently been processed. And the, the special immigrant visas, the veterans groups, there are a lot of people working on this issue with very, very little to show for it. Uh, the second basket is those relating to human rights of those left behind, as you've all noted. Um, what's happening with retribution? What's happening with the rights of women to movement? What's happening with the rights of Afghans themselves to decide if they need to leave their country? And the third basket is that of counterterrorism. Is the administration focused on all the issues that have just been raised and what tools we actually feasibly have that will not do more damage? Uh, is this an issue that can be handled with drones? I, nobody really thinks so. And then finally, the policy issue that everyone is alluding to is this calibration of how much assistance can we give without fundamentally overstepping where we think we should be with respect to legitimacy and support for the Taliban government. And I know we've all heard a lot of different iterations of that. Um, so the treasury is making some good uh, steps to allow a certain amount of assistance to go through, but for some it's not enough. And I think that's the policy question right now. Thanks very much, Andy. So now let, those are all excellent points. So let's look a little bit at how the US should go about doing this. We have the channel of direct talks with the Taliban. We saw there was a, a direct encounter in Gutter recently. Um, we have working with others, both through institutions like NATO, through the USEU, through gatherings like this regional gathering that we aren't going to in Moscow. Um, in the next day or two that before they meet with the mm -hmm. Taliban in going forward. We have the UN and the humanitarian organizations and the international NGOs, which need to get organized if we're going to deliver assistance. And then we do need to talk through and get a consensus domestically as well as with our partners about where we draw that line. I noticed the deputy treasury secretary 
came out saying there's no way we're going to release these assets anytime soon. Even though, as you said, Annie OFAC issued a couple of license, some flexibility and license so you could deliver some basic development assistance, not just humanitarian assistance other under that. So what do we do next and, and how do we proceed to take this forward? So again, let me invite each of you to say something. Ron, you have to unmute. It's the traditional line I get to say at every Zoom meeting. That's right, thank you. Uh, you know, in the round last time, I think some of the reframing or reprioritizing of some of the things or additional things that I started off with, I think was very useful because it reminds us that you can never have a single fixed set of priorities in diplomacy. Your business is usually one of having multiple priorities that you have to push forward. And one time or another, something will have more weight or more opportunity, it may not even be your highest priority if you can move it. Um, and I start there because I think it's important to realize how little leverage we have right now. Yes, there is a humanitarian crisis. There may well be very large scale death in Afghanistan. It is not clear how far that will move the Taliban. It might. Uh, but, you know, when you look at the history of our negotiations, they have managed to stand pat and pay virtually no attention to the demands made of them while the foreigners basically over time shifted. And just Recently, you saw a very large outpouring of views from the international community that there had to be a representative government, and we didn't get one. Uh, and I think I start here because it's a reminder that the tools we have to work with now may turn out to be rather weak. We have the aid that they need. We have assistance, but they want recognition. They want acceptance. These are important things how important they are in terms of changing things that they see as basic to values and to control in a difficult political situation is extremely unclear. Because of that, I think it is really vital that we look to building a much international consensus among the major aid donors, uh, West, particularly Japan, uh, and regional players because to the extent we are together in what we want and what we will give, we will have far more power than each doing something different, which allows the Taliban to play from the center and compete different aid donors against each other. But working through the logic of this, if you need a lot of people with somewhat different views to be together, then you're actually going to have to negotiate. Um, you're not going to be able to, to uh, hang. Well, let me pass to Robin. Hang on just a second. Um, you probably got to, it's my doctor's office. And I'm going to have surgery fairly soon. I got to talk. But, um, you know, if you're going to negotiate with a whole bunch of people, you're going to have to accept a lot of their goals. You're going to have to accept their pacing. And therefore, you may have to accept the minimus goals of your own. And let me leave it at there and let others pick this up. All right, thank, thank you very, thanks very much, Ron. This is the world we are in and it, we're happy to have you with us, Ron. Uh, Robin, what do you think about that? How do we get everybody, uh, there've been, I've seen a lot of individual meetings or small group meetings, but I don't yet see a process of bringing everybody together to forge this common stance. Am I missing that? You have to take your mute, unmute please. Okay, uh, I don't think you're missing anything, Tony, there's not. I mean, I'd say a couple of things uh, by way of, of um, uh, introduction here. You know, first of all, as we all know, the US can't do this alone. We had to go for three years and, and um, it didn't work out, suffice it to say. Uh, and in that process, the US has lost some credibility. So, Someone else has to be up front. I think the consensus is that needs to be the UN, um, but they're going to need a lot of support. And I think it's important, you know, for the U.S. not to outsource its policy now. You know, I've I've had people ask me that: Are you going to outsource to the British? Are you going to outsource to the UN? And of course, I defiantly say no. 
you know, we have to have our own policy and we need to engage. I think where we could start is in galvanizing our like-minded partners, um, you know, and our like-minded par partners are only a subset of the international community. Um, I mean, you know, the Western Europeans and so on and so forth, uh, because I think we could, we could reach a consensus, um, uh, you know, on what we think the most pro uh, important priorities that we'd like the Taliban government to do. Uh, but I think we have to realize that the regional groupings, and there are a lot of efforts there to get them together, Pakistan's leading one, the Russians as well. Um, but I think we need to realize that uh, our like-minded partners are likely to have stricter conditions on what we want the, the Taliban to do in exchange for this or that than the neighbors are. So there's going to have to be some compromise there, as Ron says, some negotiation between those of us in the West and Europe and those in the neighborhood uh, whose chief concern is stability at almost any cost. So I think that's important. Uh, I mean, the neighbors, Pakistan certainly has been very vocal in saying, for example, we need to unfreeze the assets and open the banks. And, you know, I think at some stage uh, we really are going to need to consider that. Um, and the other thing is, in addition to seeking a consensus on, on what we in the outside world want the Taliban to do, I think it's in our interest to try and figure out how to help them to do it, not just stand back and say, you need to do this, this, and this, uh, because they're overwhelmed right now. Uh, and you know, the likely result, if we give them a whole long list of things is that they're gonna get paralyzed and things are frankly gonna get worse. Um, it's not only the economic crisis, uh, you know, there was an article in the Washington Post today about how the jails are full, and you know they're not processing uh, any cases. So I think we really need to actively encourage countries like Qatar who have good relations after the many years they've hosted the Taliban office and others in the Muslim world um, to help the Taliban prioritize their tasks um, and start acting and getting some things done in a step-by-step -step, uh, fashion. And, and you know they need they need to consider what they can deliver first. Um, uh, whether it's what we want first um, may not be the case, but they, they need to make some movement. I mean, my priorities would be get the girls back to school. They've said they're gonna do that. I think they can do that. Let women go back to work in the NGOs, let the widows go back to work and so on and so forth. Um, and I also think the those who really have relations with the Taliban need to impress upon them um, that people want to leave Afghanistan because they're afraid of the kind of government that the Taliban are bringing. And unless they figure out how to turn that around, um, they're, they're rather doomed to fail. Um, and you know, I, I personally think that the chances of this particular government in this particular form of lasting very long aren't great. Uh, but that's all the more reason for us to keep our eye on the ball of the Afghan people and the state institutions uh, so that they can survive this period as they've sort of survived the past 20 and 40 years. Um, so that's, um, those are my views. Thank you very much. So Jim, you've had a lot of experience working with the UN and other international organizations, both in Afghanistan, but also in New York and other places. So I'd like, please apply that as you're thinking about this and just let me, to build on what Robin just said, this is a government that just had an event yesterday celebrating all the people that blew themselves up in order to get to power. So they were celebrating what we consider as terrorists. And this is a group of, this has a group of people that we've designated as terrorists in the government. So it's not that we can all of a sudden be friends. So how do, how, how, Jim, how would you see us working our way through building an international consensus, both for how you deal with the Taliban, but then also meeting these real, really serious human needs over the next weeks and months? Well, I think you've you've pointed to um, an absolutely terrible dilemma that we in the international community now face. Um, 
we have a government, as you said, that's celebrating its success, is showing, despite all the the uh, blandishments and uh, mixed assurances that they gave over the past months, there's no sign that they have any real intent of moderating their their basic the basic tenets of their ideology. Um, the way I look at it, what they're essentially doing, and this thing, this may change over time. So we're still in very early stages, remember, but the, all the people who defended the withdrawal, not all, many people who defended the withdrawal before and after kept saying, well, the Taliban realized this, this, this is a new world. They're gonna need international support. They want, they really want international legitimacy. So they will curb their behavior in order to achieve those things. I never thought that was the case. It may still turn out to be the case over time. I thought it was more likely that, they're, that they would do what they're doing right now, which is essentially holding the Afghan people hostage, saying, we've now, we've now occupied the country, we own the country, we've won, but all these people are gonna suffer and die if you, the international community, don't come and just rescue them. Give us the money, give us the support, and we'll rescue the Afghan people. And they're not making any signs about, oh, don't worry about us, you guys can go ahead and do whatever you can do. There's, a, there's some of that, but not very much. And then we've got, of course, the, the Afghans, uh, I mean, the Taliban celebration of suicide bombers and other things. They're gonna make it terribly different, politically terribly difficult for any of us to deal with them. And they know that. So they're basically saying, we don't care what you think about this. Is, this is what we're doing. That poses a really, really terrible moral issue for all of us. And I don't, I don't have the answer to that. Um, but I don't think we can expect they're gonna do very much to solve it in the relatively near term and certainly not during the course of this winter season. And those of us who've been in Afghanistan know what the winter means for the Afghan people who don't have shelter and money and food. Yes. Sadly, we do. And there are a lot more of them who don't have shelter at this time because of the combination of the fighting, of drought, of COVID, just displacement for so many reasons. And uh, a civil servants that isn't showing up because they're scared of working for the, for the Taliban. So, uh, and, you know, it's, it's very rough. And the, the economy, the banks are hardly functioning at all. So, um, Annie. You, you talked about a number of very, uh, very important human-oriented things to be dealing with that we should be dealing with, including those Afghans who are halfway between Afghanistan and here, including those who have applied. How do, they, how do we treat them? All the, those, the thousands who want to apply but can't apply because there's no more embassy and, and under our rules, they have to get out of Afghanistan and apply at a U.S. embassy somewhere else. What do we do about that? What can the U.S. government do? Uh, what kind of things would you like to see the U.S. starting to do more effectively going forward? Well, on the issue of Afghans who are eligible for any kind of evacuation or refugee status, uh, first and foremost, uh, I believe that um, the administration has to put its entirety together, all of these different agencies. If you're talking about parole, you might be talking about a State Department role and Department of Human Sur Homeland Security, but about three different areas of it. It may be HHS and DOJ. And, you know, what we don't have is that sort of comprehensive approach. Um, and that's just on one aspect of it. So if they don't bring it together, it's been a slow roll. About 90 or 100,000 people probably were put on the priority two list for refugees. A lot of organizations work night and day to put people on the list. Nobody, nobody has been processed. So it was a sort of make work exercise or I don't wanna be that cynical, but essentially it's not going anywhere. So we have a whole set of, of priorities that sprung up overnight. And as we all know, as former government employees, that doesn't mean you have the people to deal with them. 
but they could be doing a lot more to surge funding and surge staffing where it's needed. Um, just on these other set of priorities, I completely agree that if, if this is not multilateralized, if there aren't as many people on one side of the negotiation as possible, then the Taliban is going to be extremely adept at, at carving off recognition or close relationships or even money uh, from China and from other countries, and it will weaken our negotiating position. And so, as some have said, we have to remember we're not alone in this anymore. We have to be more humble. We have to actually compromise on what we want. And, and maybe in a way, I would I would flip what, what uh, Ambassador Rafel is saying, let's negotiate first with the people we disagree, you know, that we disagree with the most and figure out where we actually might come together. And then we'll bring our like-minded and others together on that. Um, and finally, I would just say, this is this calibration of how much humanitarian assistance do you give and how do you do it? I almost feel like battle lines, I mean, everybody means well, but battle lines are being drawn in a way. And so this is the kind of policy debate that can't fester. It has to be brought together. You have to have people who care about Afghanistan with expertise in other examples around the world come together and come up with a few guidelines that will really help us maybe have a series of smaller negotiations rather than, you know, nobody's suggesting this, but everything all at once. It has to be you know, how far can we get with each new release of money or, uh, or other types of legitimacy? Tony, could I throw one point in that is coming through to me as we talk? And that is simply that we're talking about a lot of really hard trade-offs. Uh, you know, when, when Ambassador Rafel talks about maybe helping the government, that's a huge political lift domestically. Um, when we're talking about whether we might have to compromise on some of our priority goals, all of which have constituencies in the U.S. And so there are two elements here that it seems to me we need to bring out or we need to mention, we can't make them happen. One is the White House has to make decisions. It, it has lots of talking. It, it has to stop the endless discussion and it has to make decisions. And secondly, it has to own the decisions. It has to explain them to the American people. It has to explain to the women's rights groups why it's not going to get everybody out at one time. Or it may have to explain to the humanitarian groups why it's only going to let so much money go in certain directions or why it's going to compromise on something else in order to get international support. I'm not recommending this position. I'm just saying there's a whole clutch of really tough decisions if the White House does not take control, make them, own them, explain them, and keep explaining to them, there will be no coherent policy. Yeah, thank you, Ron. So, so let me toss out a basic division of sort of the kind of things that we have to do, do with, maybe three parts here. One is what we do with our own citizens, with our processes of people who work with us. Two is the humanitarian challenge, where it seems to me we should be throwing our weight behind getting all the big donors together and the UN and, and the NGOs and agreeing on a way that we then make public how we're gonna get the stuff in there. And this can be done in, not independently of the Taliban, but they don't have to be directly involved in giving the aid out. And they probably will agree to that because they, they will probably be open to having people be fed. And then third, there's the kind of issues that, that our new special envoy for Afghanistan might have under his portfolio, which is how you engage with the Taliban and what you ask them. And that might be, there might be some overlap with the discussions that we, there should be with what we discuss with allies, because we'll want to ask the same things our allies are doing. But it, that might be a little bit more in the diplomatic um, chain of talking with allies and then talking directly to the, the, the Taliban. Now, is that a, a, a good way to think about how we might proceed here? Uh, given what Ron said, that someone has to take ownership for sure with these decisions. I don't know. Um, Jim or Robin, what do you think? Um, yeah, I agree with you, Tony. Those, those are the three buckets. Um, and I, I also uh, 
agree with Ron, absolutely, that decisions need to be taken here. I mean, you know, you asked us about constraints to uh, our priorities, and clearly the domestic political constraint is the biggest one, and with that, the legal uh, constraints uh, that go along. Um, so we need decisions. I think the it's um, dealing with the evacuees and resettlement and so on is a operational logistical thing, which we should be able to do. You know, that depends on us. Um, much of these other things that you're talking about really do depend not only on us, but on other countries and on, um, on the Taliban government. So we really should, you know, at the very least, be able to do what depends only on us. Um, you know, so that division is, is correct. Um, in terms of engaging directly with the Taliban, um, again, as I said in the first instance, I think it's appropriate that we step back a bit since we were so far forward, far forward um, and it didn't uh, work out as uh, some had hoped. Um, I do think, however, that we need to be careful about uh, ascribing intent to what the Taliban are doing or what they planned or whatever, you know, I think, or what they intended and, uh, and they're doing, you know, exactly what they intended all along. I think they're totally overwhelmed. Um, and that the way they came into power, as we all know, surprised them as much as it did everybody else. Um, so they weren't prepared. They weren't prepared and we didn't get what had been the object of the exercise under the negotiations, which was some kind of hybrid power sharing arrangement where the Taliban wouldn't have the primary voice. It would have been modulated, moderated by other voices and that just didn't work out. Um, so I think we need to deal not uh, with their intent or whatever, but to, um, to sparingly step-by-step step, have serious talks with them um, about what needs to happen uh, and help them to realize that if they can't carry on like they are and stay in power. I mean, I just don't think they can. I don't think it's practical. I think there'll be too much resistance. And then what do we have on our hands? You know, more fighting, more destruction and so on. And this time it'll be on their heads. Now, you know, a lot of people for very good reason are skeptical that that has any, any um, um, sway with them. Um, but I'm not entirely sure. I think it's worth making the point. You know, I'd almost suggest to them, why don't you hire McKinsey to do a survey of people so they can tell you what they really don't like about you. <laughs> you <know. laughs> so, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure they're going to take that one up, Robin. It, 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 that call is <laughs> I'd be willing right, to take now, one. <laughs> right now to, from Kabul to McKinsey. <laughs> anyway, but, uh, but, I just think we need to deal at all uh, at all levels here, um, and with the Taliban particularly sparingly. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think you make a very good point that the Taliban is probably not one Taliban. We've already seen they're struggling amongst themselves. And, and we see this after many civil wars or revolutions or other things, there are divisions that need to be sorted out and there's struggles going through. And we've already seen reports of struggles among the different factions about how you deal with this. So won't be a surprise that we might get mixed signals, that we might have an avoidance of really hard decisions because they don't want to split themselves further. And you know, we yeah. just- And who, who avoids hard decisions, Tony? Yeah, nobody <laughs> avoids those hard decisions. Nobody that we no. know. No, exactly. So, no, so Jim, okay, what should we do Whatever is behind this situation right now, how would you see the U.S. taking its its policy forward with specific steps in each of these different areas? Well, um, first to go back to something you raised before, which is the possible role of the United Nations in this and something that Robin said about outsourcing um, there isn't going to be any outsourcing here. Um, the United States can choose to act or not, but nobody's going to step in and take over the, the role that 
that we play all over the world, but have particularly played in, in, this, in this region uh, for practical reasons. No other country is capable of doing it. They don't have the desire to do it. And the UN is not a, the UN as an organization is not a substitute for national will and power and money. The UN does what the member states will allow it to do um, or will provide the, the resources and the political backing to do. Uh, they can play a vital role in Afghanistan, but um, you know, without reference to any specific uh, individuals, um, uh, having spent five years working with the UN in New York, uh, there are a lot of great people there and they do a lot of great things, but they're also aware, very wary of the tendency of people in conflict to kind of dump a whole pile of stuff on the UN desk and say, here's a mess, sort it out. And that's not, it's not an appropriate way to deal with the issue and it's something that they're very wary of. So this, the, I, there's, there's not gonna be any UN substitute uh, for the role that nation states can play in stabilizing Afghanistan and the region. So that's just a fact of life. Um, that said, go back to something that I said before. Uh, the only country that can marshal the kind of international effort that will be required to save Afghan lives and eventually persuade the Taliban to do what they should be doing is the United States. And, if, and that task is more complicated because many of our partners regard us as responsible for the situation that now exists. So there's, there's a lot of diplomatic and political heavy lifting to do to move beyond the kind of shuttle diplomacy, regional meeting kind of scenario and get to a situation where, where countries are really effectively involving themselves both in conversation with the Taliban and in the connections and in the work that needs to be done in Afghanistan. I think there is a set of common shared objectives here because nobody wants Afghanistan to come flying apart. So we ought to be able to find a way even with countries like Iran and Russia and China, Pakistan, we ought to be, find a, be able to find a way collectively to focus our energies on a, a better, set of, um, better set of requirements, shall we say, for the Taliban. And, and political muscle behind it uh, to, get them to, to get them to face up to the reality that they have created now. And the fact that they need to deal with it um, in, in their own interest. And that's gonna be very, very difficult to do. And it's gonna require the Biden administration to take ownership of something that they don't wanna have ownership of, frankly, I don't think. Well, I do think it, it is rather striking that Many people have been talking from many different countries about the need to outline a set of, whether you want to call them conditions or uh, demands for the Taliban or outlines on human rights, on diversity, uh, on diverse representation, um, on allowing access, on open paths for people who want to leave to leave or to come back in. But we haven't really seen the convening of, of a meeting that talks this through. Now there might be these discussions may be going on, but at some point it might be also good to see countries coming together and out of it saying something. Well, but you yeah, what you're not seeing is you're, you're seeing the framework. It's, it's easy to talk about the framework. Uh -huh. What's not easy is to put political muscle behind the effort that's, that's needed to, to start to implement that framework. And that's, that's what's going to be very hard for all the reasons we've been discussing for the last uh, 40 minutes or so. That's, that's a terribly difficult task. And it's going to require high level political engagement. So that basically means that the United States and a few others, and maybe with the UN and others, need to come together, agree to come together to do this. Is that what you think? A Annie, what do you think? No, I would just say, I don't know if we need to reinvent the format. If the Security Council can be one way that this comes together, it's traditional. It includes some of the right people. Um, because I think in Afghanistan, I remember having to keep a checklist of all the different, you know, dialogues and formats. It's, it's kind of proliferates. 
So what if we, you know, essentially went a little bit back to basics? Uh, I, I recognize Security Council is not a cure-all, but every single time we come up with a grouping, somebody's outside it. And so that's the that's the genius of the UN in a way. It's it's got rules that are established and people understand it. Um, so I would just say that's one of the ways that I would I would hope that we engage is to use the Security Council so much more adroitly than we've done so far. Jim, I would ask, do you think that's feasible right now to use the Security Council? Then let me ask Ron to offer any thoughts. I think the Security Council at, at the moment would, if if you tried to um, generate a program in the Security Council, given the differences that we and others in the inter, in the international community have with a country like China or Pakistan, Pakistan's not on the Council, but China. And the Chinese have made pretty clear that they, they want stability in Afghanistan, but they basically don't see the need to interfere a lot with what they regard as interfering in, in internal affairs in, in Afghanistan. So I think the Security Council, yes, it, could, it can have a role, but its role will be pretty, at, under current circumstances, would be pretty much low, lower, com, lower or lowest common denominator. The, the real energy, I think, has to be brought to bear directly the Security Council can lay out a framework. It can take all the stuff that everybody's been talking about, put that together in a resolution and say, this is, this is what we think Afghanistan should look like. With the, with the members of the Security Council, that would be a difficult task. Getting, getting anything like that actually implemented in a way, first of all, it would take time. You know, I spent sometimes six, eight months negotiating complicated Security Council council resolutions. Um, getting it done in a timely fashion would make it even less likely that it would be meaningful. So the that's a I mean that's a good idea. What that could what the Security Council could very usefully do is codify something that is agreed internationally or in the region. Uh, the Security Council could encourage a more senior level UN representative to help carve out this this new regime. Uh, in the region, a, re, re, a regime for stability, but it can't set the parameters and just expect that they're going to be uh, implemented. That's something that nation states have to do. And that's the hard work. Yep, I agree with you. They can do good frameworks if there's already a basis established for that framework, and then others have to often take it forward. Ron, any thoughts? Well, I definitely will defer to Jim on the. Uh realities of the UN, which he has lived and has the scars to prove it. Um, there is a conundrum here, which is if you want to have a regional strategy, you have to have Iran in. And we can't lead a regional strategy with Iran because neither one will talk to each other. That doesn't change the importance of anything Jim just brought up. Uh, I guess where I would come out is that we, first of all, of course, we need to know our own mind, uh, not in the way we sometimes do it, which is a full-blown strategy, which we then go and try to sell to people. That's not going to work. But we need the we need both the basic directions we're trying to go, which right now we're, we're not. We're, we're muttering bromides. Maybe we're doing some, we're, we're engaging with the Taliban, I think, to some extent on humanitarian and on relief. Uh, on getting our getting our SID, even not even the SID, getting the American citizens out. And there's very little texture to the policy that I can see. And maybe it's there and I don't see it, but I don't see much texture to policy beyond that. Uh, so we have to have some more long range goalposts, not necessarily detailed strategy, and see how these things come together. And then we may have to work in some subgroups so that they. You know, Jim has laid out what's possible with the regional strategy. We could do more to, I think, back the representative. Uh, Garno got the job now. I don't know whether that's a fine enough person, but he certainly got the skills and he knows the subject. Uh, I worked with him very well in Kabul. And uh, 
we could do more to back him. But then if you want to back him, you can't be running around the region with a separate U.S. policy because the two, if they don't conflict, they still leave people confused as to which is the policy. Uh, we may be more able to do that now that we don't have quite such a high power representative. Um, so we may have to engage in several groups and we're probably going to need a lot of different pieces of consultation and we're probably going to have to sort of sort out where there's a Taliban willingness, where we've got enough collective action to move. It probably won't be one great strategy and it will probably have to move in little bits and that will have a hefty domestic load to it as well because we have a lot of domestic constituencies that want want what they legitimately in many cases want and you're not going to be able to deliver all of it and so there's going to have to be administration at the highest level is going to have to take responsibility for telling people we can deliver parts we can deliver on some kind of timeline slowly we don't control it but if you don't take that kind of control of explaining what you can do but what you can't do as well or why you can't do things right away you're just going to have an incredible cacophony of spoilers domestically, bringing up all the imperfections in your policy, as all of us are doing right here now. Um, and, and that just weakens your hand. And the only way you're going to deal with that is to have a strong statement, not just about what you're doing, but that the White House owns it. I'll stop there. Thank you. Robin, Can I just mention one thing, Tony, since we're coming towards the end, there's a there's a special category where we have a special obligation, and that's the fate of Afghan women from from the uh, the woman in the street in the home to the to the thousands, tens of thousands of women who were educated and have gone into the professions, into law enforcement, into the courts, uh, into government, into civil administration, into the universities, into the elementary schools, the whole thing. Those people we repeatedly assured, I myself did many times, that we were with them and we were going to have their backs. And we have not during the withdrawal or since. And that's a special category that really needs to be addressed, I think, um, because of the, the, the dire straits that they are in. Some of these people will choose to stay with their families, but some of them are in, are in grave danger. Uh, female prosecutors and judges are being hunted down. Uh, divorce lawyers are being hunted down. Uh, caregivers are being hunted down by angry families who feel that their, their members of their families have been what we regard as being helped, but they regard as being taken away from them, basically. And that we can't lose focus on that. That's such an important aspect of what we did and such an important aspect of what we succeeded in doing and we can't let that get lost in the shuffle now that it's very inconvenient for the fact that we have all these thousands of women running around the country who need help and we can't give it to them. Yeah, and Jim, wouldn't that be one of these issues where we could probably bring together a large group of other wealthy countries with, with potential donations and other things to have a common position as well as we working it bilaterally? We should be able to also uh, um, get the, the Muslim world engaged in this. I think there have been delegations who've gone to the Taliban and explained, this is what you're doing with women. It's not, it's not, it's not real Muslim uh, practice. Um, I've always felt that we should, make a, we should have been making a better effort to engage the Islamic world in this. And that's, it's, not just, it's not just Westerners. Uh, we could, we should be generating a, a, an international coalition of pressure to support Afghan women, which, by the way, also serves Taliban interests. They need female instructors. They need people working in the government. They need uh, female doctors and nurses, and they need people in the universities. And they, they say, oh, we're going to take care of that. There's no sign that they're going to take care of that. Nor are they protecting the women who are under threat just randomly on on the streets, as we're all hearing anecdotally all the time. Yep. Thank you, Robin. Yeah, I would say uh, that the women's issue, whether it's education, whether it's workplace, um, is an issue around which you could get not only, as I say, our close allies, 
but also the region and the Islamic world. And I think it should be a top priority. And I think there's, there's no doubt that should be the top priority, as I said earlier. Um, on the UN, since I was advocating very much putting the UN in, in charge, I, I only meant in terms of the voice of the international community. I think we all understand very well that the UN is only the combination of, um, of the member states and that US political uh, muscle, clout, whatever you wish to call it, does um, remain the most important factor, whether it's with the Taliban, you know, the Taliban uh, admit that maybe not publicly or in, you know, with people like us, but it is, it's a very big issue for them. Uh, and as much as the people of Afghanistan are a bit discouraged with the Americans at this point, uh, for reasons we all understand, they still believe it too. Um, so, you know, we're, <laughs> we're kind of stuck. That is the reality. So we have a huge responsibility. You know, I tend to, you know, look at the political constraints that we face, and they're all very real, as Ron was putting out, as something that it's our responsibility to tackle, you know. Um, we can't just say, well, we can't do this, can't do that, because there are political constraints. We really need to push um, on those constraints. Um, uh, to, and, and if we do and come out with strong positions, there will be people, that, you know, countries will join us and the region as well. So even though we can't be upfront as we were over the last few years, with the Taliban particularly, we have a huge role in, in galvanizing and I think we really do need to step up. Thank you very much. I want to thank all of you, and I want to reiterate that what we've been ta we're talking today because these are urgent issues. That what we do in the next weeks, on very on different levels, on in the humanitarian area, in rallying international consensus on women, um, in getting international consensus to be more established on dealing with the Taliban and what they should be doing. Th these are all urgent issues and, and many lives are hanging in the balance here. So thank you all very much for your thoughts and contributions today. And let me ask uh, Michael to uh, have a few closing remarks. So thanks a lot, uh, Tony. And, and thank you to our panelists. This was a really terrific, important discussion. And I think really uh, nicely reflects what we aim to do with our hindsight upfront uh, initiative. Um, really important discussions in a reasonable balanced fashion on these very complex, difficult questions about next steps and what's next and Afghanistan's future and how US policy fits into that. And you know, in listening to this conversation, I thought of that famous line from the Eagles song, Hotel California. You could check out any time you like, but you can never really leave. You know, in the case of the US departure from Afghanistan, it's, this is an open question and one worth debating. Um, you know, there's an inherent tension at play here in the sense that on the one hand, the US has checked out. It has pulled out militarily from Afghanistan. It has said that it has achieved its objectives and that it's going to focus on other bigger priorities. But at the same time, uh, you know, the administration claims it will remain engaged in the areas of humanitarian support and regional diplomacy. But the fact that it has pulled out militarily, the fact that it has checked out that denies it, um, arguably, um, of a lot of the leverage and access that it used to have in Afghanistan. And that will um, perhaps complicate its efforts to stay engaged, even if it wants to. And I think this speaks to one of the big themes that we've covered over the last hour, the importance of other countries and other entities besides the US, the regional players, the UN, other key countries in the West, other donors, um, and so on. So, that was what I wanted to say. Again, I wanted to thank um, all of you. I wanted to thank uh, uh, Ambassador Wayne for a great job chairing this discussion. And I wanted to thank our four uh, terrific panelists, all very experienced Afghan hands who have served in government uh, high levels, thinking about these issues in Afghanistan. We'll continue to think about them. We look forward to engaging with you all again, uh, hopefully soon. But uh, with that, I will um, thank everyone in the audience for tuning in. And um, everyone, please keep safe, keep well. Um, we are now in Georgia. Thank you and take care.